So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Shelley and I'm the Program and uh, Support Manager at Flourish Together. And uh, this is our first event for International Women's Day 2024. Um, we're actually not running anything on International Women's Day itself, but around running things around the day because we know it's such a popular day. So we wanted to give uh, a bit, bit more breadth and a bit more access. We're hosting four events this year, all uh, online sessions around the topic of the power of inclusion. And today's topic is around uh, neuro neurodivergence in women change makers. And this has come about because we've really started to spot that there seems to be almost an overrepresentation of uh, neurodivergent in the people and um, neurodivergent people amongst the change making community, which we think is really interesting. So in our network and the people we work with, we've spotted this this particular particular trend. So we wanted to go into it in a bit more detail today. Um, invite some people along to hear their insights, their perspectives and experiences around how it's affected their career paths and so forth. And also just hear from the wider Flourish community about what, what we might do with this. Um, it feels like there's a real opportunity here um, to meet the needs of people, but also unlock talent in the community, because what we're seeing is there is great talent here and often the neurodivergence is lending itself to this particular context. So. We want to kind of explore a bit more about that. And we're joined today uh, brilliantly by uh, three panellists. Unfortunately, one of our panellists has had to drop out today, Kirsty. So Kirsty, we're sorry that you aren't able to join us today. Fran Arthurs from um, Neurodiversity Matters has brilliantly jumped into the saddle at the last minute. So thank you, Fran, for, um, as you say, you only live once, uh, for joining us. And what we're going to do, I'll just talk you through very quickly the agenda for today so you know what to expect. I see people have started to introduce themselves in the chat. That's brilliant. Do take the opportunity uh, to introduce yourself to people in the group. There will be in the breakout sessions, we'll be asking people to, to introduce each other to the smaller groups, but we won't be doing so in the wider group. So yeah, do make use of chat. Uh, if you have websites or social media you'd like to point people to or share your email addresses, please go ahead with that as well. So I'll just quickly talk through the agenda for this lunchtime session. So. In a moment, I'm going to be introducing our panel and we'll be having a panel discussion exploring the impact of neurodivergence on career pathways and how we can unlock talent amongst the neurodivergent community. Um, evaluating the current support systems and we consider ourselves at Flourish part of this. So, you know, what's out there that's great um, and ways to enhance support for the, for the next generation of people coming through, in particular social entrepreneurs coming through. Then around about 12.40, we're going to break out into smaller groups because we want to hear from everyone on the session, if at all possible. So our panellists and um, myself and my colleagues will be taking uh, a group each and we'll be having smaller discussions and using Jamboards. If any of you have used Jamboards before, they're basically an online whiteboard system with sticky notes so that we can hear from everyone in terms of you know, what the opportunities might be and how we might be able to take some of these things forward. Then we'll have a bit of group feedback around about one o'clock. Hear from all the smaller breakout groups um, as a whole group. And um, so everyone can share the key thinking and insights that have come from their groups as well. And then we'll, we'll wrap up around about 1.30. Now, I appreciate this is um, over lunchtime. So if you are munching away on your lunch, that's absolutely fine. Um, feel free to have your camera on, on or off, whichever you feel more comfortable with. And like I say, any questions that you've got, pop them in the chat, or if you prefer to come off the mic and ask questions as we go along. It's a very relaxed, informal and uh, friendly format. So please feel free to speak up if you'd like to. Before I start, I'd also like, just like to introduce uh, my two colleagues who are here today from Flourish. So we have Fran. Fran, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. I'm monitoring the chat in the background and I will be facilitating a breakout room with some of you. Thanks, Ryan. And then Anna, do you want to say hi as well? Hi, hi, I'm Anna, and I'll, I'll be doing the same as Fran. So yeah, I'll just let people in. If you get logged out and just jump back in, I'll let you back in. And yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And then, so I'm going to move um, straight on to our, our panel discussion. So we're joined by three women change makers today. And um, we have Aya Shatu, and we have Misha, and we have Fran. So what I'll do, uh, panellists, if it's OK with you, I'll just ask you to briefly introduce yourself one by one and tell us a little bit uh, about uh, who you are, 
your social venture and um, your interest in this topic. So Aishatu, can I come to you first? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Aishatu and my social venture is Idaraya Life CIC, which is an organization providing access to textile handcrafts as well as outdoor experiences. Um, we focus on women. Um, we started off focusing on engaging racially marginalized women, but um, as we go into our fourth year, it's really evolved and we've got an incredibly diverse set of people that we work with and that engage with our services. And um, in terms of how I understand my neurodivergence, because I haven't been diagnosed and I keep on thinking as to whether there is any value to me getting a diagnosis right now, um, a lot of it is more to do with um, cognition for me um, in terms of just how I can think in ways that just confuse other people and not in a beautiful, I can tell you what day of the week, the 12th of January, 1952 is, but um, very much in the sort of, I can say one thing and I'm very convincing and I truly believe it and I can do something that's completely the opposite the next day. And it's not because I'm necessarily flighty. My brain literally, I believe what I'm saying in the moment and I focus on things in the moment, but I'm quite easily um, distracted. And I've had to employ a whole bunch of mechanisms to keep me focused. And um, it's really ended up affecting sort of like tra the trajectory of my work in my career. But um, yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about neurodivergence as we're as we're going on. So that's me. Oh, thanks, Aisha. Um, Misha, can I come to you next? If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your social ventures and um, your interest in this topic. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Um, my name is Misha. You might hear some people call me Mimi. Um, I operate as a professional artist under Mimi Frizzles. Um, I am currently setting up an unincorporated, well, set up an unincorporated association called House of Creative Freedom. Um, and that is to kind of express my passions um, coming from a teaching background, um, nurturing the individual as an individual. Um, I work primarily with uh, two to 18 year olds um, at my after school club. Uh, I also run a youth club. Um, I do quite a fair bit of one-to-one -one mentoring uh, for some children on uh, EHCPs and they may be neurodivergent themselves. Um, I have ADHD and autism, so I can really resonate with some of the individuals that I work with. I'm quite proud of the little cohort that I have. Um, my Yeah, my passions primarily lie in really acknowledging the skills in people and in communities and finding ways to really push that forward from a creative, creative wellbeing and alternative education point of view. So, Thanks, Lisa. And and Fran, I saw you lost connection, but I think you're back with us. Are you back with us? Fran Arthurs. Oh no, have we lost? Oh no, I can see there. Here, Fran, can you hear us? Can you come off mute if you are here? Oh, I think we may have some connection problems with Fran. Yeah. Um, no worries. Uh, Anna or Fran, would you just drop? other Fran aligned just to let her know that we can't hear her um, and to give us a shout if she is able to join us and speak. Brilliant okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to you one by one and um, ask you a bunch of questions about your experiences so I'll, I'll start with you again Aisha too. Um, I'm just interested to hear to what extent or how do you think it's played a role so you're Neurodivergence has played a role in how your career has developed, the pathway that your uh, your working life has taken. So I'll say I'll start with the, I guess the less positive aspect for me, in that it meant that I translated the way that I worked as me being really unfocused and unprofessional, and I tried very very hard to sort of function as my colleagues would. So, and it's from things like, you know, managing diaries and doing regular bureaucratic processes that I'm well practiced at doing, but somehow I would just miss simple, I'll miss simple things in terms of, let's say, spelling, for example, and I'll have like frequent 
repeated corrections on certain things. And even though I could speak so intelligently and I seemed like I'm quite capable, it didn't make sense. So it always seemed like I wasn't paying attention or I just wasn't focused enough at the work that I was doing when in fact it just happened to be the way my brain functioned. And that really knocked like my confidence because it meant that I didn't, I didn't aspire to do a lot more because I just felt like I wasn't quite, oh, you can't get the documents correct. So, and I'm just saying documents because a lot of my professional experience is doing office work and customer service type stuff. But I noticed very much that I thrived when it came to human relations and it came to delivering service to people. And if I had to do a presentation, as long as I was on the speaking side and not like the writing up and sort of like creating the slideshow side, I was really in my element. So there was something that I saw in that, not necessarily that I was terrible at writing because right now I do see myself as a writer, but there is something about organizing and it's just organizing and managing and managing chaos that I think I've seen in comparison to other people in my family who are sort of like not neurodiverse, who are just, is that is that normies? Is there a name? Is there a name for peeps? Um, but yeah, no, neurotypical, it's, I think. <laughs> neurotypical. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, neurotypical? Is that the word we're going for? But, um, and it's just seeing how I'm fine with order until I'm suddenly not fine. I tend to exist in these two separate extremes where, I can organize a space and not in an anal way, but I can organize the space and I can work in a space. But as soon as disorder starts to descend into it, it very much descends into chaos incredibly quickly. And that's something that I've tried so many different things. I've read so many books. I have followed people on Instagram, on the internet. I've done like decluttering courses. And it's something that I don't see, I don't seem to be able to fix as such. So I think it knocked my confidence in that I felt like there was definitely something lacking about me not being able to present a certain way, but seeing as that I had that and I wanted that understanding from people, I find that I started to be a lot kinder to myself once I became more understanding of other people who were like me, because I was holding a lot of people to the standards that I felt other people were holding me to. And once I started to be a bit more considerate of other people who may well have been neurodiverse or just people who other people in the office or other people on projects will be like, oh, that one's a bit funny, that one's a bit weird. Once I started to really come into my own with my human relations skills to understand how people had certain needs and how with certain allowances, even often people who are now neurodiverse will outperform people who are neurotypical in the same sort of like circumstances. And so with that, I started to give me, give myself those tools and that kind of empathy as well. So I always say to people, like, if you give me a thing, if it doesn't go in the diary, you don't see me put it in the diary, there is a 70% chance I'm not going to make it. And it's not because I don't care. I would be talking about, like, for example, this session right now, I've been talking about this session for the last, what, month and a half, just speaking to friends, like, I'm going to do this. If it wasn't in my diary five minutes before this call was due to start, even though I was speaking to someone and telling them that I was on this panel today, I almost didn't make it. But for the fact that my diary actually gave me an alert and I don't know how to explain, I don't know how to explain that because I know it, it's on my mind. I know the time, but for me to just organize myself and organize my brain to be situated, it takes a lot of safeguards. So I think, The fact that I had to, I needed that empathy and that support as an individual, and I found myself giving it to other people, this sort of like two-way thing occurred, this sort of two-way thing occurred where I was able to support other people more, a lot more proficiently, and I was able to also articulate my needs a lot more proficiently in terms of what it is that I, what, what it is that I needed in order to function at work. And ultimately, um, just from trying to make things more accessible in all the ways is why I run the organization that I do now and I'm doing the work and the jobs that I'm doing now because I just want people to always know that they have agency and they have possibilities. And if you need extra tools, then you need extra tools. And that's just it. That's not to say that you're less than or it's not to say that you're not as good as or you can't aspire. 
But if you need extra help to do something, then get the extra help. You shouldn't deny the world our skills. Yeah, so there's of, really key yeah. themes there, aren't there? So there's obviously playing to playing to your strengths, recognizing your strengths, because there, you know, mm. there are a huge number and variety of those. And then, like you say, tools and coping coping mechanisms um, or safeguarding mechanisms to to you know catch you when when things might might not go exactly to plan. So um with everything like that in mind, but also your experiences, what do you think we can do so as a community um to help unlock talent in this area? So whether it's um approaches or whether it's products and services, you know, what, what might be in our gift to do? Is that for me or for Yeah, me? I'm gonna stay with you and then oh, I'm gonna okay. around if that's all okay. right, no worries. Um I think more than anything else, like acknowledging like publicly and explicitly acknowledging that there is space for people who are neurodivergent and explicitly asking for resource, like asking for what resources people feel they need or what people may well identify as they might. Sometimes people can articulate that they require support, but can't articulate the support that they need, for example. And yes, I know that that means more work for us as organizers or as hosters of like, of, as people hosting spaces, but doing that bit more work just means that we reach so many more people. I think having networks of spaces, networks like this where people can meet up and discuss ideas, because it can get very isolating, you know, like when you have a certain way of thinking and you're accustomed to sort of telling yourself certain things over and over again, you can end up in this vacuum. And if the people who are around you are people who are accustomed to you existing in that vacuum, it makes it even harder to sort of like not think that way. So making spaces that are regularly available for you to engage with as a professional and not to be babied. Like, I think that's a really important thing where when someone is neurodiverse, um, someone's got autism or anything like that, there can be this tendency to almost like um, mother them or to try and be like, oh, I'm making allowances and like, and not intentionally patronize, but it's a thing of like the, the there isn't a challenge with our cognition is there isn't a challenge in terms of our processing ability in terms of understanding what needs to happen it just means that the world has been constructed for a certain set of people to work in a certain set of ways and there are some adjustments that we need to make in order to function in the world as it is for people who are neurotypical so I think that it's really essential I think it's just essential that the space is made the questions are asked like simple as that because everyone what I need is very different to what Mimi needs or be different to what anyone you know like other people need and try to sort of have a blanket solution I think is where a lot of people do fall into trouble where it's sort of oh I know that this person who has ADHD needs to be called the day before a meeting to make sure they've put it in their diary so this other person with ADHD must need that thing as well and it might not be, maybe the other person prefers to have text messages and finds calls really intimidating or, you know, like it's really important to allow for our individual experiences and just acknowledge that it is gonna be extra work and fact that, factor that into anything that you are organizing and, um, and doing. Mm. That's really interesting, thank you. And, you know, with um, increasing automation, you can almost imagine products and services and the way we interact with people being personalizable much more easily by the person you know by the end user you know yeah decide how you know mm -hmm. we have much more control over how we how we're communicated with how we're minded to do things because like you say it's it's specific for everyone and then last question for you Aisha too is just about the um the next generation so how can yeah. we support the next generation because we know that you know we know the need is there and potentially growing um you know what's that what's the part that we could play as a community to help the younger generation. So when you say younger generation, do you mean younger generation of social entrepreneurs or younger generation of just general I population? Think, I mean, but yeah, we're, we're, we're particularly interested in social entrepreneurs, um, but mm. so, you know, some of the potential social entrepreneurs might not be social entrepreneurs yet. They might just still be in school <laughs> and not be able to see those pathways, for example. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think more than anything else, having this sort of display um, of being very very explicit and being um, transparent about neurodivergence and how it affects the work that we do without belittling it 
and without making it seem like oh because I'm neurodivergent all the work that I do is affected by my neurodivergence and I feel like it's really important not to make it one's entire identity I do understand that some people use that as their niche because that's who they want to support and that's useful for the work that they're doing but I think it's really important to acknowledge that being neurodivergent is an element of the entirety of your human being and there is a lot more to you that that you that one is to develop so it's sort of like more than just like you would have anyone who had any other sort of um any sort of disability you know like you have the tools that you need in order to navigate the world as it is and I think as long as we keep on having the conversations and be like, oh, do you need things to be printed on a particular color of paper and not making that seem like a massive chore, like just asking what people need, like, do you have a diagnosis? Like being open with someone, if you feel like someone's neurodivergent, don't assume it. Maybe they're just having a day where they're particularly flustered. Maybe they just haven't had some lunch. And so they're a bit forgetful because sometimes people can just decide like, oh my God, you're so flitty. Or people casually go like, oh, I'm so ADHD. I'm so forgetful. And she's like, it's seriously nothing. It's nothing like that. It's quite, it's infuriating more than anything else because I'm trying very, very hard to be this functional professional who does things really well and presents really well and provides the quality service that I know that I can. But for whatever reason, because of my genetic makeup, I can be hindered I can be hindered by myself when it comes to functioning so I think making it explicitly clear that being neurodiverse is not the entirety of one's being although it can affect a lot of things making sure that responding to people who do have neurodivergent needs is done swiftly and without drama like just ask the question and if you can do it you can and if you feel like you can't provide support be explicit about the fact that you can't provide support rather than that person feeling awkward that they can't be in a certain space because they can't manage it. And I feel like uh, we probably should encourage more people to get diagnosed like much sooner because it would just made such a massive difference had I had a diagnosis when I was at university, probably in terms of the things that I would have had access to. Like I muddled through and a lot of people do, but encouraging people to understand that it's not like it's not like some dirty sin. There was nothing you could have done about it. Like fair play, there is some societal and environmental factors that can make it more prominent in your life than others. But ultimately it's, it, these things are genetic. There wasn't, you had no choice in the matter. It wasn't because of how you, you know, like decided to understand this. No one's deciding to have attention deficit disorder. There's no one deciding to be autistic. You know, like people are as they are. So um, yeah. I think that's that's where we are like just providing making space yeah and responding swiftly thank you that's brilliant we'll be um we'll be hearing more a bit more from you later on in the in the groups um but thank you so much Aisha so I'm going to move on to Misha as you're next on my screen or Mimi I don't know where to say Misha or Mimi I'm going to go for Mimi today (laughs) I answer to both don't worry oh excellent oh so yeah um I'd just like to hear a little bit about how you feel this has um, influenced or played a role in how your career's developed? Yeah, I mean, this was quite a nice question to to ponder on um, and to reflect on my working career, I guess. Um, I was always quite keen as a teenager to get into work. I think at like 13, I was begging my mum for a job. Um, And that is where my neurodivergency has been a bit of a superpower in some ways that I've always been really eager to learn, um, always researching, um, love meeting people, you know, there's a lot of positive, positives to it that I've reflected on, um, as well as a few things, the hurdles to jump over. Um, I've had a lot of jobs since I was about 15, um, or like did lots of volunteering, um, but jumped from job to job, um, and sometimes had two jobs alongside college and things like that. Um, I found that working in places that more, when they're more franchise or bigger teams, I always really struggled. Um, I think that that's because there is this one size fits all kind of approach and um, not really acknowledging the individual as an individual. There was one job that I really thrived in and that was being part of a, team of less than 18 people maybe even less than that um and my manager really not 
I wasn't diagnosed at the time, but she it felt like she really understood me as a person. So within that one job, I stayed there uh, over uni and things like that for like six years. And I really was really loyal to that. Um, but because she would create roles for me as I evolved, she would just say, oh, well, I'm going to move you from this one to this one now. And I know now that that's because she could see that my the repetitiveness of it would start to drain me and I'd switch off and wander off and things like that. Um, I Great boss, we, we, we should have them cloned. <laughs> Sorry? She sounds like a great boss, we should have them cloned, you know. She was brilliant. Was and I, uh, I cried when she was uh, selling oh. the business and the new manager that came in was rubbish. Um, I finished uni and um, went into another small company because that's what I preferred um, but really really struggled with um, that manager because he was actually neurodivergent himself and I still wasn't diagnosed um, but we head bumped a lot. Um, I then pursued uh, after I had my little girl went into teaching and you could really see quite a lot of my passions igniting there um, through the personality test that I've done with Flourish in the last few weeks um, I'm half and half mediator and campaigner because I'm 50-50 introvert extrovert and I think that really shows who I am that I really love working with people um, I love work, especially love working with the younger generations. Um, but I left teaching because as a teacher, I felt so confined and restricted. And to have a job where I really thought that I could go in and dance around the classroom and get everybody in the room passionate about all the things that I'm passionate about and to not be able to do that, to be so restricted to a curriculum and marking and, and even then, reaching physical mental burnout because I was working until you know getting up at 6 a.m but work marking things until 11 12 o'clock at night and it really showed the emotional dysregulation started to really come out and um, it was something that I struggled with as a teenager but as an adult to have emotional dysregulation full-on adult tantrums really knocked my confidence, really knocked my mental health and who I was as a person. Um, Cause that is something else that I've really struggled with is the social anxiety side of things that I, if I'm, that's where now in my job, if I'm in one of the, having a day where my regulation isn't on point or my cognitions aren't as switched on, I have a tendency to withdraw a lot. Um, so that really does affect how I work now. But I pursue, have pursued a role that I've created myself, I guess, in order to express my passions, but to really hone in on the skills that I have, that even though I'm quite a spontaneous person, that really helps with teaching children and working with individuals, because some of these individuals are just as spontaneous as I am, that I'll spend money and time on creating resources and lessons for them and they'll say I don't want to do that and the good thing is about that is I'm just as spontaneous that I've got another five activities lined up <laughs> so you've got a few to pick from um I need routine but I hate it and I think working for myself and being able to kind of take this at my own pace and take it as flexibly as I need I've been able to implement a routine that's implement but also alter it as I've needed to as things have happened um and I notice now that I really thrive as a social entrepreneur I'm on my own um just like I have have things that I feel like true hurdles but then have to realign my thoughts and realize that there's so many other places that I excel and because there is so many we're like Ayashati says as well it's just a different neurological pathway there's no there's nothing wrong there's no issue there's there's the issue is that there's this social norm of needing to behave and perform in a certain way um and I think that's what's beautiful is that there is so many change makers coming forward and kind of creating roles for people that might not have skills in finances but they want to be an admin manager perfect you just don't help me with my finances you can help me with this and the logistics of things and 
um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people coming out of the woodworks, like myself and I shot it. I think you've explained really, really clearly why being a being a social change maker can be so well suited to somebody with neurodivergence. And um, it'd be interesting. I, I wonder just in the wider entrepreneurial world, whether we'd see the similar pattern, actually, um, you know, that ability to flex the workplace and um, to play to your strengths and mm. to meet your needs and, and so on. So just thinking about that in terms of um, unlocking talent among the neurodivergent community, is there anything else that we we could be doing, whether it's as flourish in the way that um, the community approaches things or products and services be are designed or delivered? Any thoughts on that? It's really tricky because it's it is the whole one size fits all approach that doesn't work. <laughs> my mind immediately jumps to let's set up support groups and um for entrepreneurs and we'll have regular meetups and yada yada but then my view is that there isn't a neurodivergent and a neurotypical I believe that just everybody has all these different pathways and you'll work well with others and you won't work well with others and that I think really just like Aishatu says breaking the stigma just talking about it and being able to I mean, I'm. you know how grateful I am to be a part of the Flourish Network, but to be able to, even before this was set up, to be able to talk to other women and, you know, slip it into a conversation and then that somebody's then had a personal experience of that, I will vocalise it because I believe it should be talked about. Um, and, yeah, just I, I don't really think there is one set way to do it other than just awareness breaking the stigma and having that open mind to working with different minds I think that's definitely a big part of it and from from our point of view I feel really happy if um if we've created a space where people can ask for what they need you know on an individual level then I feel that's a massive win um and I think like you've described a lot of workplaces you know conventional workplaces just don't have that um, space where you, people, individuals feel that they could ask for the, the specific thing that would help me that overcome a bar barrier or, you know, whatever it is that individuals need, whoever they are. Um, so that's that's a, a kind of something we've tasked ourselves with, definitely. And last question for you is, um, how can we, you know, as a community, better support the next generation coming through or support the nurture, the you know, potential change making to come through? Well, this so when I read this question, I was thinking about some of the, the teenagers that I work with, particularly the 15 to 18 year olds. Some of them are going through a little bit of a panicky time of not really knowing who they are and um, not really knowing where their skills lie. I think especially COVID has really tainted quite a lot of this. Um, so I'm I will work with the individual on an individual basis and really try and hone in what their skills are. Um, but from the social entrepreneur point of view, something that would have really benefited me when I was setting up. And I know that Flourish offer resources, and but I must say navigating websites is one of my hurdles. So um, like skill shops, um, I know that something I'm really good at is project management, but I am terrible at, at my admin. So if there was uh, opportunities for I guess organizations and association associations to come together and say that like I have a dedicated day or a few hours where I need someone who can do this and I oh I can offer my skills for this and I can do this and I think that that really then instills confidence and um use usefulness um a, a place to express uh, your skills and how you guess how useful you are um thank you Thanks, Mimi. That's great. Well, yeah, we'll come back to you in a bit. But I'd like to move on to Fran, because I think, Fran, you've been able to rejoin us. I hope you have. You were definitely there earlier. Are you with us, Fran? Oh, we lost her again. Anna and Fran, can you see if Fran's joined the call? Yeah, yeah, she's there. Can you hear us, Fran? Yeah, we, we can see you speaking, but we can't hear you. But I can't see a mute. Um function so maybe it's the headset oh my audio is not working uh, okay oh what um what a shame Fran not to worry um I wonder if um if Fran if you if you want to uh, pop a bit of information about you 
and um, ND Matters into, into the chat. So at least everyone on the call can hear a little bit from you. And if at any point you manage to get your audio working okay, I realise this is an absolute last minute ask. So appreciate you might not have the tech completely set up as planned. Um, do put some um, information in the chat, then people can still hear from you and connect with you if need, if they're interested in doing so, which I'm sure they are. Um, okay, so what we'll do now, I think we'll move into our breakout discussion. So this is where we're going to move into some smaller groups and uh, discuss some of these questions in a bit more depth. And what we're going to do is use Jamboard. So have people on the call used Jamboards before? No, I can see some shaking heads. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly share the screen. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And I'll just show you a Jamboard. And um, when you're in your breakout groups, your group facilitator will um, share a link for this board with you. So, right, can you see, can you see my screen? Can you see this, this board, everyone? Give us a nod if you can. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so this, this is a Jamboard. And what it is, it's basically an online whiteboard. So if we were all in a room together, we'd have the flip charts out now and somebody would be scribbling up and people would be writing on on post-it notes so this is a way to try and make this work in the online in the online space so what we've got here is we've got three pages and we're going to go into our groups and chat through this so basically Anna or Fran or whoever's leading your group will put the link in the chat you click on that and that will bring up this board for you so when you're in this board you then click on this square icon here can everyone see where I'm pointing this sticky note icon yeah so when I click on that, you'll see it brings up a sticky note. So then you just type into that and you press save and it puts a little, little post-it note on the board and you can move that around. You can make it really big if you want to make a really strong point or you can make it a bit smaller to fit it on the board. You can choose what color you do it in, but these are basically sticky notes. So you just write um, what your insights or what you learned from the discussion or any thoughts that you might have on these sticky notes. And we'll chat about it as we go as well. And it just means because we're going to have a number of different breakout groups, we'll be able to hear from everyone on the call. So whether or not you want to come off the, of the mic and chat, it'd be great if you did. Um, but if you just rather add your own sticky notes to the boards, then that's perfectly great as well. And we've got these three different boards. So we're going to spend about half an hour. Yeah, about half an hour on this. Um, let me just check the time. And then we'll come back maybe a bit less, maybe about 25 minutes. And then we'll come back and hear from the groups collectively. So the first one that we're going to be looking at some um, insights and learnings from the panel discussion. Then on the second board, you see these arrows at the top. Can you see where I'm pointing now? This moves you through the different yep. frames. Yeah, thank you. So the second one will be looking at what does neurodivergent change makers need? Um, and I think this is our opportunity, although I absolutely agree, there is no one size fits all. There are ways that we can um, improve things. We've just done a, a pilot with a group of um, change makers with additional needs, some of whom had physical uh, disabilities, others were neurodivergent, others had um, mental health conditions, others had chronic health issues, so a whole range of different um, needs, but we found that bringing them together um, created a very different space and an opportunity to really tailor our um, programme to meet their needs and make sure that everyone could be included, even if you know, for instance, some of them had to go to the hospital for a significant chunk of the programme. So there are things that can be done. What though, might those things be? Nick? What might those things be? And then the final board is opportunities, solutions and ideas. Um, so, yeah, we just want to hear from all of you. And you're each going to have a brilliant uh, facilitator leading your group. So they'll take you through the discussion. If you've got any problems with working out how to use the board, they'll be able to help you with that as well. OK, so I'm just going to stop sharing and then pause the recording. So welcome back to anyone who is listening to this on, on catch up on the recording. So we've all been in breakouts for the last uh, 20, 25 minutes or so discussing uh, various topics relating to this. And what we're going to do is just go around the groups and get some feedback from the respective groups so that the whole group can hear what other people were talking about. And I'll I'm going to add some of these thoughts to my Jamboard as we go along. So if it looks like I'm emailing people, I'm not. I'm adding things to the Jamboard. Uh, Fran, I can see you're on my screen. So can I start with your group? Yes, indeed. Okay. 
Um, first things first, thank you to Aishatu and Misha for sharing today um, because the girls in my session resonated uh, wonderfully with pretty much everything you both shared and said about Hello. your experiences of life, um, careers, and kind of also the joy of highlighting the positives and the negatives, but really, really owning the positives and finding your power in that neurodivergence. Um, absolutely lovely. So that's that's what we took from that. Um, but equally, we did focus on some of the key points and some of the, the wording that you guys used, um, which was the babying and the childish nature of people's um, sort of propensity to make you feel a little bit silly, that you need a little bit more managing and you need a little bit more hand-holding and it can be quite patronising. Um, but equally, what we were aspiring to was that Misha had this lovely moment of affinity with a helpful manager and a manager who understood neurodivergence and understood Misha's working behaviours and kind of motivations and played to her strengths in a really positive way. And we agreed wholeheartedly as a group that that's the dream, that's the goal, is that we find in life, whether it's work, relationships, friendships, et cetera, people who understand how we tick, that's universal, you know, neurotypical, neurodivergent, that's what we're all looking for, is that sense of commonality, appreciation, and respect for one another that we've all, as Aishatu said, we own our space, we take our space and we make space for everybody. Um, so yes, I like that. It's of course, International Women's Day theme. So inspiring inclusion is what we we're after. Um, what do neurodivergent change makers need? Now this was an interesting one. Um, what do we need? Uh, more effective mental health support, more effective understanding and support mechanisms in place, in space, whether it's employment, whether it's societal, whether it's more understanding from our family and friends and our support network, it's understanding that often neurodivergence can go hand in hand with other things that are going on in the background. And we can't just assume that because someone, as Aishatu said, sometimes the girl's just not had lunch. And if she's, you know, not functioning at 110%, that's because often there's other things going on. So we do need to be more mindful and more accommodating of those things. Um, one of the big things we got was learning to ask for what you need, because often you're embarrassed, you're ashamed, you don't understand, or more than that, sometimes you don't actually know what it is that you need. So it's just to ensure that you've got a safe space to have that open dialogue. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that. I know I can, but sometimes it is a case of just asking for what you need, because sometimes asking the question gives the solution and really removes that sort of um, anxiety. Of course it does. Okay. Um, support and resources that would help. We looked at a network of people who can empathize. So really engaging with the neurodivergent network. Um, one of the girls was saying that there's a great community of that in Greater Manchester where you can find social media support groups and things like that. But of course that you need to be mindful of using technology in a safe way when you're talking about um, vulnerabilities of identity and kind of, well, you know, how you feel about things and how you're trying to find your place in the world. So I thought that was good advice, mindful advice. In terms of opportunities, solutions and ideas, we all agree as social change makers and as women making our way in the world, um, often opportunities and ideas can be stifled by red tape. And we said that neurodivergence and being part of a neurodiverse community often is frustrated by the red tape because we have the beauty and innovation to be able to see beginning, middle and end and find ourselves quite frustrated and suffocated by the illogical bureaucracy that exists. Um, because actually nine times out of 10, we can say, here's the solution, why are we not doing this? And it's very frustrating for us. Um, what could Flourish do to help in this space? Um, really great consideration from Sarah. I thought this was great. Uh, neurodivergent mentors and mental matching so that we could have, you know, fully established social entrepreneurs matched with starter, uh, much like time to grow ladies that we've got on the call and pairing people with neurodivergent mentors so that we build that really beautiful peer support network. Um, we talked a little bit about financial resilience and financial security underpinning because sometimes life gets in the way. Um, so no, really thoughtful, mindful, open and honest conversations in the breakout. And that's what we talked about. Thanks, Fran. That's brilliant. Um, right, I'll move on to the next group. Um, who should I come to? Mimi, should I come to your group? 
yes higher, higher. Um, but if you want to feedback or someone else whichever's good um well yeah we we had a lovely uh, lovely discussion um I, I love the breakout groups um trying to think where to start um some something that some I can't even get my words seeing your divergent moment um struggling well feeling misunderstood um is quite one of the big things um and also not having a diagnosis but being able to self-identify um there's a lack of belief and awareness around it um some challenges um being diagnosed with other things um but potentially having a neurodivergency um and making that transition transition from having government support to then just be working on your own um so i think having networks like flourish and stuff is really beneficial especially with the open mindedness of it um support to kind of help with things like that is frustrations with um the medical and community supports and um, when life needs to take a halt um especially because burnout and masking and things like that can be something that you really struggle with so um being taken seriously feeling different um a really interesting comment as well was um being deemed as not having empathy <clears throat> when you're autistic but I myself as an autist as an autistic and someone who is full of empathy um I've got a higher sensitivity to that and sometimes that's actually quite valuable in your work as is having someone who can have that empathy um one size fits all approach I think that that term has been thrown about quite a lot and it really is the way that they take approach to things um I love the neurodivergent mentors um we've talked about co-working and having body doubling sessions um body doubling is something that I really need alone just having that person next to me um but with it being obvious that there is quite a lot of the neurodivergence in the flourish network maybe having a nd support group um I hate WhatsApp groups, um, so I will avoid that. But like a Facebook group, like a forum, somewhere to go to and just say, I'm I'm really struggling with this. Um, but ap approaches that could really work in the workplace is when you're starting a job, mapping out skills, tendencies and what experiences you've got. Um, I, I guess that kind of comes with the confidence of being able to ask for the help that you need. Um, if you already know that within yourself, then you can present that confidently to a manager um, or a boss. Um, yeah, and we had, I, and that didn't come out in nice one nice statement because that's <laughs> how our conversation went. We were kind of jumping and chatting and reflecting on um, things ourselves. But I was lucky to have Fran from ND Matters in my group too. So I've popped her on the ex uh, existing provision provisional services because um, oh. she's really lovely to chat to. Well, I thought that came out as a beautifully articulated. So um, thank I'm you. I don't even remember what I just said. <laughs> I do because uh, it's recorded and I've uh, typed up some notes as well. So all good. Thanks, Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, I'll move on to Anna's group next, if that's all right. And would you? Yeah. Yeah, we again we had a lovely chat, and there was a very um, consistent theme of people not realizing till later on in their journeys, having had, you know, quite a few struggles, barriers, or um, difficulties that they were they did have a neurodivergence. So that that idea that you have to, you know, struggle for a while before it becomes clear is was a sort of shared experience, um, and being part of a community or being surrounded by people who understood that or were yeah open to it or neurodivergent themselves again was really important um can I look at my jam boards now to remind me uh but yeah the experience of being marginalized or um just not fitting in companies or organizations and not liking being managed was a sort of theme that people resonated with and there were they there was you know, there are a lot of skills, entrepreneurial skills, but are often constrained within these sort of tight, high control managing environments. And so that's possibly a reason why people feel they have to set up their own ventures or go it alone because cultures 
don't they're very slow to change and um they're not very inclusive which or or open so people do mask or find it hard to be open about their needs um which led on to actually a lovely comment that lisa made that i really liked was leading through vulnerability so being a bit of a vulnerability um hero or um advocate or you know modeling it yourself actually helps other people to be vulnerable as well and and through being vulnerable people get can play to their strengths so within people talk about a team or a group environment where people would say well I'm not very good at the note taking or I'm going to forget it so everyone could play to their strengths and someone else could step in if if it was an area that they wouldn't you know weren't naturally strong at so knowing or having having some sense of your strengths weaknesses or or as Michaela was saying learning style when she did some when she did her master's um there was a understanding from the tutor or the, there was a willingness to understand people's learning styles in a lot more detail so any sort of training anything was tailored to people's particular learning styles uh, the buddying thing or the um, idea of having a body mentor or a, a, as Misha said a sort of body double that was a another thing that people liked the idea of um complement strengths and weaknesses and um, just go on to the first last page yeah and ways of working documents for people that was more corporate which is Again, the corporate world, there's a feeling the corporate world's very slow and that moving into social enterprise allows that change to happen a bit more quickly, but it also exposes you to the pressures of being responsible for it and being a sort of, being within a company advocating in a way is, is safe, but it doesn't, it's frustrating because you don't get the results quick. Um, and so going out on your own is it's it's tempting but also it comes with that challenge of burnout and support and so it's a it needs a lot of support for people to tread that path which is where a flourish comes in but it's it's tempting because you can make those changes a lot more quickly which is yeah that definitely feels like there's an opportunity around you know creating that that support because the it does seem that the flexibility yeah. and the flexibility of being your own boss and also, you know, whether it's heightened empathy or being able to spot solutions is leading people into this pathway. Um, and then, you know, it's thinking about how people could be a, a supported administratively mm. or in other areas um, to keep their ventures going. I'm conscious that we're nearly at time. We've still got a couple of groups to feed back on. But if people do need to log off, um, thank you for joining and uh, do put your contact details or any relevant resources in the chat and um, other people can pick up on those, but we will, but do, yeah, if you do have to go, um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I will uh, just ask to hear back from Aishatu and then I'll feed back a little bit from my group as well. Aishatu. Right, so what we got, insights and learners from the panel. There isn't too much to add because everyone's covered a lot of the things that came up, but um, it was great that um, we had visionary leadership being something that came up a lot because of the way it is that neurodivergent people typically think um we can see a lot of like big picture stuff or it can be the extreme of seeing like in teeny tiny details and so being able to have that kind of unusual or less sort of like the less common way of seeing life means that you can do things differently and also it means that um like very much uh, Mimi's example of having five things in the back pocket when the kids spontaneously don't want to do the things that she had initially planned for them to do. And seeing that as like a clear sort of like example of how that, how neurodivergence gives that dynamic leadership where not necessarily like, whereas that may be over preparing for someone who was neurotypical, for someone who was neurodivergent, you do that almost instinctively, depending on how it is that your brain works. So it's just like, there's certain things that we just find easier to do than someone who doesn't think like us and being able to lean into that and utilize that in our spaces was just something that came up um, from when um, Mimi and I were talking. In terms of what do neurodivergent change makers need? Um, in terms of challenges faced, um, there was frustration at the barriers of accessing healthcare 
and um, being able to even engage with like staff advocacy um, or even self-advocacy um, rather processes um, in order to ensure that you've got the support that you needed. Um, also looking at the fact that people will consistently remove themselves from harmful environments such as like employment for example of not being able to function in organizations because they're made in a way that is literally directly damaging to someone who's neurodivergent because it doesn't support them so like that is a massive challenge because it's not to do with the capacity to be employed or to do work but it is literally to do with not being able to live well and be all right in a particular space that is directly causing um causing harm um what are the barriers i think we just had like one of the main ones that i think it was amy who mentioned it that we're not being met where we are usually um a lot of the time there are there are sort of like things being done when people are explicit about being disabled or anything like that but a lot of the time they they just they they quite actively respond to things like oh someone might be a wheelchair user or someone might be visually impaired and that may be because of long-standing experience of responding to those needs and neurodivergence seems to be new in the grand scheme of sort of like <laughs> medical medical advances so I think there's just something about not being met where we are regardless of whether you state your needs or um or not um some support and resources that could help social media being a um, social media being a freeing space, being an open space where you can sort of like take more of that dialogue. Um, you can take some more of that power back of being able to express your neurodivergence how you want to, as opposed to how it is that other people can make it seem, which um, brought us to the gaps in the provision. Um, namely, in this case, we're thinking of organizations like the Autistic Society that do produce um, actual things, but um, actual like leaflets and things like that to support people. But a lot of it is either targeted at people who are no longer in employment because uh, it assumes that, oh, you're neurodivergent and you've been diagnosed, so you're probably not going to be employable or you're probably getting this diagnosis as a child. And so for people who are neurodivergent and have business acumen, people who are neurodivergent and want to work and want to do things, there is like this gap in that space where people aren't being supported to live these full lives. They're just, just being assumed that they're not going to want to do much with their rest of their existence. And um, in terms of opportunities and solutions, um, existing provision that Chloe shared was that there is a post-diagnostic um, pathway that exists, whether that's national and whether that is and, and the credence to the quality of the post-diagnostic pathway is still on the, on the question, but it is something that does exist where if you're diagnosed as an adult, you can get some support um, as to how it is that you now navigate the world with the diagnosis, although um, receiving, um, receiving access to that six years after said diagnosis is probably not very um, very helpful, which is what's happened in this particular case. And um, yeah, providing employment for neurodivergent women, like actively, just like we actively try to engage with, with diverse groups of people and try to ensure that we've got representation from the community that we do support. I think going out of our way to ensure that we can have people apply for things via video, via audio things, not having to do application forms that have certain questions if they're not relevant to the actual job that's going on, but actually express, express what is needed for the business rather than trying to follow current employment procedure, I think will make such a big difference because I'm someone who interviews very well, but I absolutely despise doing like tests and things like that. So for me, if, a, if, a, if something involves like a psychometric test or some sort of test, even though I would have the capacity to process the information, I would absolutely, I would absolutely flunk it in a test, regardless of how, how much I study for it. Like that's literally what I've always had. So it's a thing where, you know, like being able to have those alternative ways of communicating. And like Chloe just said that she's the opposite, whereas she will probably like a set of questions that she just has to answer and not have to show all of her charisma in front of you um, before she's employed. And um, yeah, so I think that that was that was part of the solutions that we got to, but we were talking about loads and loads.
Oh, loads and loads. Thank you so much. Right, I'm now trying to look at my tiny gem boards and see um, it, what else we discussed to add. There was there was loads. I mean, the, the flexibility was key. We had a, a big chat about conventional workplaces and in particular school settings just not being suited. Um, but we also saw some upsides. So, you know, school is very reliant still on memory and recall and passing exams, which actually the workplace can be much more adaptable, especially in this um, in this age where there are so many different tools and devices we can use. So wherever we do need support, there's things out there that, that actually can support us. Um, there was a lot of chat about, um, about the positives and um, just how good and empowering it is to know that there are other people out there in similar situations who are really making it work for them. Um, and the value in sharing some of those approaches. So the, the peer support value seemed to be huge. Um, Charlotte or Sophia do jump in if you if anything uh, springs to mind. Uh, we talked yet yeah, again about different different ways of uh, applying for work and doing work. So you know the the video applications as well. Um, Charlotte was talking about accountability buddies. Um, yeah, body doubling as well. Um, Charlotte and Sophia, what else did we talk about? I've, I've now got everyone else's notes on my page. I'm trying to see which which ones. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if, if either of us could remember, we probably wouldn't be here, would we? <laughs> it's, all, <laughs> it's all written down here. Um, uh, we had a nice chat. We had a great chat. And I think it was, there's, there's so much good practice out there that we have, you know, we've captured a fraction of it here which we can obviously start to think about, but also how we share it more widely with other organisations. This is coming through really loud and clear that one of the drivers behind um, people setting up their own their own thing or, or creating uh, work that, you know, whether they're self-employed or they're setting up a venture, is that the, you know, the conventional workplace isn't suitable for many people for lots of different reasons. Um, and so if we can not only support people to set up their own thing or be self-employed or find employment but also for other organizations to change because it shouldn't just be a particular shape of person who can um, thrive in a, in a workplace you know and actually there's a there's a workforce uh, shortage out there so organizations are going to have to adapt and they're going to have to become more accessible and more inclusive to people in order to access the talent that we know is out there so I think that's a that's a reasonable summation. We've only um, gone nine minutes over time, so so not too bad. So if anyone would like to stay on the call for a couple of minutes to ask me or any of the Flourish team or each other questions, then please do. We'll keep the call open for a little little while longer. Um, but in the meantime, I might just ask Fran to say a couple of words about her session that she's got coming up, and um, Anna's also hosting a session and Michaela as well. Michaela, I think you're still on the call. Do we just want to talk about the other um, International Women's Day events? Because there was people on our breakout group who are interested in hearing about those. Anna, do you want to go first because you're tomorrow? Yes, thanks for reminding me. Yes, so tomorrow we've got a session on lived experience, which sort of ties in very well with this because sometimes it is, well, often it's people's experiences that have led them to set up or... Um, do community work so yeah that is currently um, sold out but watch out if you know people book off then then the, if you jump up on the wait list then you'll be able to get a ticket but yeah again the first section is going to be recorded and uh, not the discussions afterwards but that should be made available for people to catch up or listen again so yeah thanks Anna and, and on Thursday we've got how do we ensure flourishing futures for all this comes off the back of our Finding Financial Security programme, which is where we very much understood um, as a network and as women more than anything, that to create a social venture is often a luxury that many of us can't afford to consider and really throw ourselves behind if we don't have all our ducks in order, which seems like uh, the idealistic notion in 2024. But the how do we ensure flourishing futures for all focuses on the things that we need as social change makers to be able to do that. So it's having financial stability and having those pillars of support and reliability in place. Um, the session, the lunch and learn, we've got a great panel of speakers and they are from established change makers who have set up their social enterprises, their CICs. Um, on the basis of the fact that they're still making enough money to pay the rent, pay the bills, not have the stresses of day-to-day -day life 
and talk about the importance of having those sort of stability factors in place if they're necessary or if you really just hit the ground running and how you do that effectively with safeguarding your sanity, your safe space and your financial security in the process. So it should be a good one. I'm excited. Thanks, Fran. And then Michaela, I think you're on our panel for um, looking at the heritage of some, you know, what can we learn from women change makers in the past? Is that right? I can see you've come off mute. Hi, Michaela. Yes, yes, I am. Um, I, I have an ancestor called Anna Parnell and she was the founder of the Irish Ladies' Land League, which is also known as the Women's Land League. So at that time, uh, she was a Protestant from an upper-class family of landlords that her and a brother and a sister and a mum, uh, they were all fighting to get the Catholic tenant farmers the right to own the land. And at the time, they were being evicted into destitution and starvation. And they actually crowdsourced money to build tiny homes, uh, feed the people, and just basically stop the genocide. So I've learned a lot from them. And I'll, obviously, I've done my own little change-making stuff. But I hope to see you all there. It'll oh. be really good. And that's next Monday, isn't it? Yes, Monday, the 11th of March at 6 o'clock. Brilliant. Oh, so well, it'll be interesting. Thank you. And I just want to say a particular thanks to our panellists, uh, to Oyashatu, to Mimi, and Fran also for stepping in where you could where you could I'm sorry that your audio didn't completely work thank you everyone I realize everyone's having to log off but uh, thank you for joining us uh, we'll be sending email with uh, links that you can sign up to for future flourish events and so on but it's been brilliant having you here thanks everyone for your contributions <laughs>